All right, now, President Trump, as we've been telling you, is getting a lot of heat uh, for saying that this would have been a very good reason to keep that travel ban, his original one, which was tougher than the one that's now going to the Supreme Court. American Islamic Forum for Democracy founder Zudi Jasser on that. Zudi, what do you think of that? What the president was saying, essentially going after his own Justice Department, is saying you should have stuck with the original one. It was tougher and had, had, had more teeth in it, but it is what it is. Uh, but, but that that w would have been the kind of thing and would be the kind of thing to presumably stop or slow the type of stuff that's been going on in Britain. What do you think? Well, I think, Neil, the point for the American public and for the world is that this guy was trained in Libya. So these havens, which are anarchical governments, which we can't trust, that can't be vetted, our own citizens, while on the one hand, people may want to parse and say, well, he was a UK citizen, he wouldn't have been covered on the travel ban. Listen, there are many different layers to our security and our safety. We need to allow the executive branch to keep us safe and not continue to call this a Muslim ban. It's not a Muslim ban. It's about six countries that happen to be Muslim majorities. But I think as a Muslim, there's nothing more pro-Muslim or pro-Islam than making sure that jihadists, ISIS sympathizers, Islamists are not allowed in. And if anyone thinks that that's how we've been vetting people up until the Trump administration, they are just poorly informed. We have not been vetting ideology. So it's important for us to start doing it. And the president is using the, the, the moment in which the world is paying attention to this heinous attack in, in Manchester and then in London to say, listen, we need to look at people coming from these countries where these people are being trained. Uh, Zuni, we're just getting information now via Reuters that British police, who we know had identified these attackers, are now sharing that information with us. The London Bridge uh, attacker uh, was a, a gentleman by the name of Kerem uh, Boot, uh, age 27, but I'm mispronouncing that, and I also regret calling him a gentleman. Uh, but police also named the second London Bridge attacker as Rachid Raduane, on no age given there. But they were familiar with these guys, familiar as well, uh, where they lived, presumably searched their apartments and locales, which is why they held off releasing the names. But if the community was familiar with what they were up to, and some were, not all, I had to stress, do they have an obligation to share information that worried them, like we have in the United States or in New York? If you see something, say something. What do you think? Absolutely. And Neil, the layers of exposure that we have here are just so profound. Uh, the question is which community. Most Muslims that we know would obviously turn in these individuals and would, would report sus, you know, suspicious behavior, but the communities are so often segregated. I mean, look at the Paris attack in November 2015. That same cell committed an act of terror in Brussels in March 2016. Uh, stood was, was not found by any EU security services for four months and then committed the act in Brussels. So we're seeing the same thing where these known wolves, where you have thousands that are being monitored, too big of a pool to monitor. Why is it too big? Because we're not focusing in on ideology. We're not focusing on the way these family networks, community networks protect one another. They may not all be advocating for the suicide bombing or the violence, but they certainly are, are part of the sense of, well, they're living in the land of war, not the land of Islam. This is the enemy. They hate us. It's a conspiracy theory. All of these ideas make a tribal community lock down and not help security but services. But how does that keep and happening? I'm not blaming you know, Muslims for that, but that, that, for example, in the sake of Kurram Shazad, uh, the police knew a little bit about what he was up to. Uh, M15, the British intelligence, knew what he was up to. There was no evidence to strongly suggest an attack was imminent, but they knew enough to know he was up to something. Now, it's easy to play, as I often say, a Monday morning quarterback here, but where there's noise, there's oftentimes something bigger. And yet again and again, we either ignore it or it slips through the cracks. What happens? Well, what happens, Neil, is that our homeland security, and in many ways, I'm thankful they're limited by the laws of when these guys break laws. The imam that radicalized this guy, actually, Neil, is in Dearborn. His name is Imam Jibril. He was in prison for a little bit, but then came out and has been found to be associated with the radicalization of a number of ISIS recruits that have gone to Syria while he sits in Dearborn, Michigan, preaching this sort of anti-Americanism, etc. So we Muslims have to start to make these guys radioactive so that the antiseptic of sunlight is apparent and they become uh, uh, um, pariahs in the community. But until that, 
This can't be fixed by Homeland Security. Do you think they're just afraid, Zudi? Do you think they're just afraid for their own lives? No, that's a cop-out. Listen, people should be afraid for their lives, Neil. Are my family in Aleppo dodging bombs and ISIS has really set up shop down the street? But that's something's got to explain their, their reluctance to, to help authorities. And time and again, uh, I'm not saying all, but a good many obviously pass up the opportunity to share, you know, curious things they notice. Yeah, the, the, the problem is denial a sense of lack of urgency, it's not my problem, the, the lack of a linkage between non-violent Islamism and jihadism with the violent Islamism, that lack of linkage which with the media, universities, others contribute to saying, oh no, no, it's just the terrorism, it's just the extremism, it's not the underbelly of ideology which is the problem, and that lack of connection between all of the precursors with the final step of radicalization is the problem that we don't say, oh, it's our problem because they were going to report just when they want to put on a belt. No, long before he puts on the belt, he starts to hate America, hate our military, hate what we do. That is what our community is in denial about dealing with. All right, Zudi, thank you very, very much.